Of course, many contemporary traditional realist writers have let go of such nostalgia, flinging it into the abyss, in fact, embracing points of view as different as each individual writer. But they still write narratives that follow the plot patterns 19th century German theorist Gustav Freytag described visually as a triangle, using terms virtually every writer has known for the last hundred years. Exposition, rising action, climax and resolution, or denouement. As Madison Smart Bell writes in his terrific book, Narrative Design, quote, As a process of movement, the linear narrative is time-bound and sequential. The temporal vector runs out of the past towards the future, and the linear narrative follows it in a sequence of causes and effects, like a string of dominoes falling, unquote. I see such traditional linear narratives as mostly a series of escalating scenes, or as I like to think of them, triangles of conflict, often between three characters represented by the three vertices. Each scene a bit like a miniature version of Freytag's triangle, introducing conflict and then rising to a climax in minor reversals that build to larger, more consequential reversals as the story unfolds. And when we use the word reversal, we mean just that, a character shifts from one state to its opposite. Certain scenes in traditional linear narratives are almost always obligatory. That is, if a writer is writing a triangle story, an affair of a married woman with another man or woman, for example, the writer is obliged to write certain scenes, at least one with the wife and her husband, one with the wife and her lover, and one with all three of them in the same scene. All scenes that show an escalating conflict that eventually resolves the imbalance created when the woman first started her affair. She leaves her husband for her lover, she stays with her husband and dumps her lover, or she leaves them both and decides to take a Pilates class, or throws herself in front of a train. In any case, the conflict either creates a reversal for her that changes her utterly, usually reflected in a specific action, or she remains the same and the reversal occurs in the reader. Nope, that woman's not going to change one damn bit, the reader says as she shakes her head and turns off the nightstand light, chinning the comforter to go to sleep. In her terrific book, Writing Fiction, A Guide to Narrative Craft, Jenna Burroway describes this traditional narrative structure as the inverted checkmark, a series of small reversals or minor shifts in power between characters or reversals in a character's emotional or psychological state, rising to larger reversals that ultimately change its main character, the kind of yes-no, plus-minus, or on-again, off-again dichotomy one might find in computer programs. In such narratives, characters say yes or no to each other, usually no, <laughs> face obstacles and then overcome them again and again until they're finally triumphant or defeated. Cinderella, invited to the ball, finds her stepmother saying, no, you can't go. But meeting her fairy godmother finds a way to go anyway, with the caveat that she must return by midnight and so on, until she's fitted with the glass slipper and married to the prince and they live happily ever after. Or not. Even non-traditional writers use elements of traditional narratives. Fabulists might, for example, make the lover a caveman, as Stacy Richter does in her story, Caveman in the Hedges. Or writers may take the basic triangle of conflict and rearrange the narrative modularly, or out of chronological sequence. Or a metaphor might intrude into the narrative, a slowly descending ceiling, for example, which comes to represent the feelings of the betrayed husband, as in Kevin Brockmeyer's The Ceiling. It's all a matter of taking an old story and making it new, making it the writer's own. While such constructs can be helpful to those who wish to write in traditional narrative forms, forms that have evolved over thousands of years and still seem to keep us spellbound, I found that in many respects, traditional forms are often the most difficult to write and still remain fresh and new, especially in a contemporary context. In many ways, we've read so many stories and seen so many films and television shows that we've become increasingly sophisticated at predicting what's going to come next, so that in many respects the contemporary realist writer must not only reverse actions and characters, but must also constantly reverse our expectations again and again to keep us always in a place of surprise and suspense. <laughs> 
unpredictable characters and events that keep us reading stories to find out what happens next. But, on a deeper level, the best contemporary stories are also almost always subtle yet complex explorations of motive and deep characterization. Why do people do the things that they do, such stories ask. Characters do things that utterly surprise us, yet, when we look back through the story, we realize that that action was inevitable, perhaps the only outcome possible. We come to realize, as we do in life, that people we may have known for a lifetime are at best familiar strangers, and at worst complete ciphers, utterly unknowable, calling to us across a chasm of misunderstanding, illusion, delusion, and even self-delusion. This is the territory our most gifted contemporary realists explore. Nonlinear, non-traditional, experimental, and postmodern narratives, on the other hand, what Madison Smart Bell describes as modular rather than linear narratives, may often be pro-contrivance and pro-artifice, and as such may completely subvert traditional ways of understanding narrative, the very illusions traditional writers of realism work so hard to create forcing us to awake from the fictional dream and to recognize that the stories we're reading are just that, stories. Artifices erected out of words, ideas, characters, and actions. Not so much to help us understand narrative as to question what it means to be human, creators of artifice itself. As Martone and Hemley write, quote, If there are rules to the writing of literary short fiction, non-traditional stories seem to go out of their way to break those rules. In fact, many readers tend to think of this type of prose in terms of experimental, innovative, or alternative fiction. Yet, not in traditional stories have always existed alongside the traditional realist story. Their writers have not so much tried to improve or change the traditional story, but instead have followed an entirely different set of aesthetic conventions, assumptions, and expectations about what short fiction should be." Unquote. What a traditional contemporary writer like Raymond Carver might refer to negatively as tricks, non-traditional writers will instead celebrate and explore with the same obsession writers of traditional narratives might have, say, about marital affairs. For this reason, I tend to think of traditionalist, realist writers as people interested in creating dramatic emotional effects in readers, while non-traditional writers seem more concerned with intellectual issues, seeing stories like elaborate games or puzzles to assemble and solve like chess or a Rubik's Cube. If, as Madison Smart Bell writes, linear narratives are a bit like sculptures, which writers must whittle away at like stone or wood from blocks of memory, imagination, and experience, non-traditional narratives are more like modules or collages, assembled out of small component parts then linked together, often through images, image clusters, scenes, or snippets of scenes, that may not occur in any linear chronology, but instead in patterns that make subtle, often unconscious connections for the reader and the writer. In such stories, linear or nonlinear scenes may echo or mirror each other in what Charles Baxter calls rhyming actions. In their most extreme form, as in Donald Barthelme's The Indian Uprising, modular narratives become skillful yet remarkably difficult to understand collages of text and image that seem pasted in in what may at first seem a kind of random order ultimately forcing us to see connections that may not be readily apparent until we've read stories numerous times and allowed them to work in our unconscious minds over days and weeks, or sometimes months and even years. In a real sense, the writers of such non-traditional narratives want the readers to become co-creators of the narratives themselves, taking apart stories as if they were dissembling Swiss watches just to see how they work deconstructing stories, to use the term popular with such postmodern theorists as Derrida and Foucault, to see how they tick. In such narratives, Bell writes, the task of the artist is not to discover the essential form of the work by whittling away the dross, but to assemble the work out of small component parts. This breed of artist is not so much a sculptor as a mosaicist, assembling fragments of glass 
and tile to form what can be understood at a greater distance as coherent, shapely images. In narrative art, this mosaic method is the basis for modular design. Martone and Hemley roughly categorize non-traditional narrative writers as either fabulists or formalists. But many experimental writers defy such categories, and many traditional writers borrow non-traditional techniques and vice versa. A professor or workshop director might say that a writer needs to learn how to paint realistic paintings first before she can paint cubist paintings like Picasso's. After all, Picasso began with traditional sketches and drawings and then evolved through many well-known periods, the Blue and Cubist periods, for example. Perhaps that kind of thinking is true of many writers, but not all, and too often professors and workshop directors who have a too narrow aesthetic might discourage gifted students from making the very kinds of experiments that often create distinctive and original art. The short story form is, after all, still evolving. Fabulous narratives, as Martone and Hemley write, have often grown out of ancient traditional forms such as the tale and the fable and the fairy tale, but have also borrowed from the Dadaist, Surrealist, and Absurdist aesthetics of the early and mid-20th century, using the irreal or the unreal notions of the subconscious and the unconscious that have grown out of the modern psychology of such 20th century theorists as Freud and Jung and in such modernist writers as James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and Franz Kafka. With such forms, such contemporary writers as Kevin Brockmeyer, Stacy Richter, or Kelly Link may begin as Kafka did, with an absurd premise, that a man could turn into a dung beetle overnight, that the sky overhead could fill with a slowly descending ceiling, that cavemen and women have returned to steal our spouses, or that rabbits saddled with little men carrying spears have taken over our front lawns. And they might develop each of these stories more or less realistically. Stories can be wildly unrealistic, such as George Saunders' Sea Oak, so unrealistic, in fact, that their lack of verisimilitude forces us to consider issues never available to a traditional narrative. Such forms may also be a kind of speculative fiction, which has evolved into such popular forms as fantasy and science fiction. And many otherwise realistic stories may often move suddenly into mysterious and dreamlike territory, like Rick Bass's The Hermit Story, when the main character must live a while under a vast pocket of the ice in a frozen lake, or like Anthony Doerr's The Caretaker, when a man who suffered African genocide decides to cut the heart out of a beached dead whale and bury it in a kind of sacred rite that assuages his grief, if only a little. Such shifts into the mystical actually deepen realist stories, moving beyond the predictable to the unpredictable and beyond. Formalist narratives, Martone and Hemley continue, may be metafiction, fiction about fiction or about the process of writing fiction. Or they may be appropriations which borrow from non-literary forms such as letters, speeches, confessions, directions, advertisements, instructions, telephone messages, award citations, and even grocery lists. Daniel Orozco's orientation is an excellent example a satire of the kinds of impersonal orientations one might experience on the first day of a new job. Or stories may be collages of texts or images with a conscious sense of white space left unprinted. In such stories, the reader must finish the story and provide the glue that holds it together. Perhaps the most well-known contemporary collagist is the late great Donald Barthelme, though his story, The School, in the Scribner Anthology is less a collage than a kind of absurdist comedy about basic questions of love and death.